house on Sunday morning. Are you glad to be here? Amen. <laughs> Woo! I can see right now it's going to be a great day. God's people are alive and well. See what Sunday school do for you? Amen. You get here an hour early and yep, ready to roll. Amen, amen. And a great new class this morning uh, in, in the different class areas. It's going to be a great day in the Lord today. Are you here to worship Jesus? Amen. Are you glad to be in God's house? Amen. Are you happy to be in God's house? Amen. Are you happy with Jesus? Amen. Well, you know something? We're going to sing and we're going to worship the Lord. We have a great time with the Lord. Uh, start off with a song that uh, Francis made famous. And uh, we liked it so much that uh, we learned it without her. And so now uh, let's all stand and it should be he is glorious. Bubba? Glorious. Glorious God. On that. No, we need the glorious God words, if you don't mind. Ah, that's the one we're looking for there. Let's stand up and sing this great hymn to the Lord. Crank it up, baby.
him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Let's bow our heads, Almighty Holy God. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house this day. We thank you for being able to worship you from our hearts to your ears, Lord. May all that is done here today bring glory to your glorious name. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing, my friends, while Douglas leads us through another worship song. He is worthy.
prayer time at North Carolina Baptist Church, a time that we set aside every week to get our hearts and minds, our very souls, in sync with Him. There's only way to one do today. There's only one way to do this, friends, and that is confession. You just ask God for forgiveness. And even though He already knows what you've been doing, He knows your very thoughts. He knows the intent of everything you're thinking. That's how powerful God is, and he loves us anyway. But during this prayer time, you need to lay it out before him, even though he knows, because he wants to, for you to hear your heart. I'll have one prayer request here of Finn Bernie. It's Kara McLean's, Bernie's baby. Kara's, Kara McLean's, which is the daughter Carolyn's. Anyway, three-month-old baby in Florida running on fever and runny nose. That isn't good. Okay? Continue to pray for all those in need physically, spiritually, psychologically, financially, whatever. Lay it out before the Lord. Let him know you care. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. The altar is open, my friends. If you need to come down to the altar and get on your knees before God, I highly recommend it. bowed and your eyes closed, just make a confession to God. Lift up your heart to Him. Whatever's on your, on your plate, whatever struggles that you may be having, whatever family issues may be there, give them to the Lord. And oh friends, just don't take it back. Leave it there with Him. Almighty, holy God, we take this time on Sunday morning, your day, as we worship you in song and scripture and message and education. Lord, we also lift up those that are in need, like this little baby. I mean, I can't even imagine having sick babies as tough on us adult humans as even more so on them. But you're, you've got a handle, Lord, because you're the Lord. Father, is anyone here today who has not had the privilege of confessing and getting the great joy and relief that comes from that? I pray, Lord, you'll touch them right now, that they will feel your presence in a very special, special way. Father, I pray your blessings on everybody that's here in, in a way that they will leave here with joy in their heart, with a refreshed remembrance as we are going to celebrate your supper, your Lord's supper today. <laughs> Father, make it powerful and meaningful that we will do what you told us to do, and that's remember. Remember who you are. Remember whose we are. That we're your children if we're believers, and if we're not, we certainly ought to be. Help those that need to cross that road, cross it. Help us, Lord, be transparent and open. Help us be critical where we need to be critical, but loving and passionate. Oh, Father. We lift up this prayer today in this place at this time in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Let's pray some more. Our God saves everybody. Let's stand up and sing Our God saves.
So um, I see everybody out here today. Make sure you, you're happy and you notify your face today that you're happy because you're in God's house, and that is something to celebrate.
week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Young people, I think it's the time you get to go to young people's church. Huh? Young people, you don't get to go today. <laughs> I'm never in the loop. What do I know? Just teasing. Let me tell you what I just got to witness. A real proud mama and a papa. I'm sitting over there and watching them. So there was two proud fathers this morning when they were singing. One in heaven, because they were singing to him. And one right there, listening, being part of it. That's what it's all about, friends. If you would, today is a very special day. It's a Lord's Supper day. We will be doing the Lord's Supper later on. But I have prepared by God's grace for you something that you may or may not have ever been fully cognizant of, aware of. If you've got your Bibles, uh, you may start off in the book of Mark, but I can tell you that we will be moving about. I want to unfold for you, biblical scholars, as best I can, the chronological sequence of the Lord's Supper as it unfolded that day. You may or may not have ever uh, have done that, so uh, today we're going to do it, try to put some meat on the bones as it were. First, though, I need to give you some. Here's a brother, this thing ain't. Anyway, first thing you need to do if you've got your uh, handout, which I think is in the bulletin, there it is, it's up on the screen now. Good. Remember the contextual setting, as it were. What was behind this meal that we call the Lord's Supper? Which, by the way, for those of you who are making notes, the Lord's Supper as we know it was a whole horse of different color than the reason they were having the supper. But the end result is both are about remembering you got to think back now. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as we know it at the celebration of the Passover. Well, what's the Passover? <clears throat> the nation of Israel with the tribes who moved into the southern part, the land of Goshen and Egypt, were there about 425 years. They went from a family to a nation, two million plus. The problem is all the goodness that the nation had going for them was lost when the son died and the new kings took over and they started looking at all them Jewish folks out there and said, my goodness, there's a whole bunch of them and just a few of us. Now, I don't have time today to unfold all the little idiosyncrasies in all this process. You need to go to the book of Exodus and read it. As a matter of fact, on Sunday night, the class that we uh, were doing for a long time, we've been going through it verse by verse, unfolding. It's been a great experience. But in summation, since the Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go, and God had sent Moses in there to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Famous saying, right? Let my people go. And the Pharaoh said, no, I ain't, ain't doing it. I need them. They're mine. I own them. So God said, well, I'm going to convince Pharaoh to let y'all go. And he sent a process of ten very serious plagues. Every one of the plagues was designed to cause an affront to one of the many gods of Egypt. The last one was the death angel. God had told Moses, select, select a unblemished year-old male lamb or goat in the tenth day of Nisan, kill it on the fourteenth in the evening, sprinkle the blood with a hyssop bush on the side post and the lintel of the doorway, Roast the lamb and eat it with your family along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs and be ready to leave. In other words, when you're eating the meal, be eating it fully clothed, ready to boogity boogity because you don't know when you're leaving. And this was the culmination of the tenth plague which God had told him, look, if you don't do this, the firstborn will die all through the land 
after Egypt. In order for the death angel to pass over, the house had to have the blood of the lamb on the door. Those that obeyed God's will through Moses were spared. Those that didn't, which was almost all of Egypt, including Pharaoh's son, died. Can you imagine the thousands and thousands and thousands of grieving parents that night? Even though they were pagans, they were still hurting. Can you imagine the realization that struck the nation of Israel as they faced the reality that their Jewish, their, their Egyptian neighbors are now in grief and have lost? And can you imagine the knowledge that came to the nation of Israel when they faced the reality? God said he would do it, and he did. He killed all them people because they were disobedient to him. And they were inflicting his people and would not let his people go. Folks, it's not a trifle matter to mess with God. In case you haven't learned that yet, you really ought to. Young people... You can blow it off because you're young and you think you're going to live forever. Let me give you some truth. You're not going to live forever. <laughs> and if you want a peaceful life, get with Jesus. Otherwise, it's going to be a rocky, rocky, rocky road. Look, I'm not talking about playing lip service to Jesus. I mean sold out heart, soul, mind, and body. When the day came, the children of Israel were spared. Lambs had died in the place of sons. As a result of that, God said, every year you do this Passover meal. Why? To remember that night. To remember that I am God and you're not. Remember I did what I said I would do. And so every year they did that. So I want to walk you through because with that background is why they had the meal that night. And the result of that meal is what we call the Lord's Supper. So go to Mark 14. Put your finger on verse 12. Give me an amen when you're there. Mark 14, verse 12. Amen. Well, that's six of you. How about the other 35? Come on. Oh, there's seven of you. Okay. I'm just messing with you. This is serious, but you know something? We can enjoy it. And be serious. Amen? Amen? The key is, are you learning? Don't leave here today and not know this story because I'm going to unfold it just as sequentially as I can. All right. First thing, make sure I got the ribbon of the Lord's Supper. I got that. There we go. Here we go. The place is prepared. That's where you should be. Amen? Mark 14, beginning in verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, as his disciples talking to Jesus, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready and prepare for us there. And the disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover meal. So what we have here is the place prepared. Where to set up. Let me tell you something, folks. Not do you want to set up, but where are you going to set up? It wasn't an option. It wasn't we're going to think about it. Let's deliberate this. If we, we want fried chicken or or T-bone steak, it was, we're going to do it. The question is, where are we going to do it? And so then Jesus sent them to this particular plot in verse 13 to a man carrying water. Now, to some of you biblical scholars, you already know where I'm going to go with this. The rest of you grab hold of this. What's the big deal? Well, the first thing is, I want to know how, of all the people in that city, they found the one man toting a pitcher of water. Because men in that day and age don't tote water. Got it, Toya? 
They don't. They didn't carry water. So the next question is, which you're not going to get the answer for today, why was he carrying it? I don't know. All I know is in this town of Jerusalem, there was a man, and he had a jug of water for whatever reason. Maybe his wife was sick. And they came up to him, and they followed him. They found him first because he stood out like a sore thumb. Here's this joker and Bubba carrying water, right? So they latched on him, followed him, got to the house, and you heard what I said? The room being ready for the Passover. Not only is it being ready, the room is furnished and ready to go. Now it's going to prepare the meal. And in verse 16, the disciples did. And so it was. So you got it? That's about the place. Amen. Amen if you understand the place process. The miracle, there's a miracle there with the guy with the water, folks. To me, there's a double miracle. I don't know what all them people coming into town for Passover, how they found that one guy. But look up here. If you follow what Jesus tells you to do, he'll lead you where he wants you to go. Amen. Oh, that sounds like another sermon right there, don't you, Captain? I, I, it just came to me. The Holy Spirit just gave me that. I'll preach that later. Secondly, the body prepared. Let's go to John. I think my marker has just been stolen. John chapter 13. John chapter 13, beginning in, uh, say, verse 3. Thank you, folks. Everybody there? Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. God, I talk, man, that's a little sermon right there. Ain't that one verse. Isn't that cool? Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands and that he was come forth from God and he was going back to God. Woo! I love it. Rose from supper and laid aside his garments and taking it down. Now, to stop right here because guess what we're doing? The, the body is getting ready to receive this meal. They're at the house. They're already, they're there. They're upstairs in the room. They're fixed to sit down and eat, aren't they? And somebody should say, no. Nope. Why? They just sit down and eat. The table was about that high off the ground, off the floor, and they laid down leaning on one elbow. Now, I don't know how in the world they ate doing that, Magina. I got a clue. I know one thing. I have trouble eating sitting up on chair. No, I don't. <clears throat> but laying down, that'd be a real something. And they kind of lean on each other, they're all around the table. Look, that picture that Michelangelo did of the Lord's Supper, that's a real pretty picture. And I'm glad he's a great artist. But let me tell you something, don't put your theology on artist pictures because he just he painted what he wanted to paint, but that has nothing to do with reality. Okay? They're up in this upper room, a low line table, they're all laying around it. They're getting ready to get into the meal, okay? And then Jesus gets up, rose, verse 4, and laid aside his garments. That's his outer garments, kept on his, his uh, girdle thing. And then taking the towel, he girded himself about, and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so it came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said, Lord, you wash my feet? Jesus answered said to him, What I do to you now, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And that word part right in your margin means participation. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head, everything. Give me a whole bath, Lord, if that's what it means. Jesus said to him, here comes a Another theological note here for you. He who, he who has bathed, that mean is, means being saved, only, needs only to wash his feet, but it's completely clean. And you are clean. Are you getting ready? What else is said? But not all of you. But not all of you. In other words, if there are believers, he's telling them this is like a metaphorical thing. All I need to wash your dirty, stinky feet running around the sandals all day out in the sand. Because spiritually, you're already clean. But not all of you. Y'all know who he's talking about, don't you? All right, it's coming up. For he knew the one who was betraying him. 
And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. And so when he washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? He's asking a question. Now, remember that we're keeping this in context. They're kind of laying around the table. And this process of washing the feet didn't happen in five minutes, folks. He had to go around every single one of them and wash their feet, okay, with this process as it's unfolding. And, uh, and then they're back around the table. And now, what happens around the dinner table? And y'all, well, wait a minute. Let me back up. Does anybody ever sit around the dinner table and eat anymore? A few of you? Most people I know have got the fancy TV tray down in front of TV news. They don't sit around the dinner table. Use at my granny Cutts' house, you'd be at the dinner table if you was going to eat. Now, if you didn't want to eat, you'd go someplace else. But that was a time of discussion, dealing with what's going on. Anyway, I'm bringing that up, not talking about granny Cutts, although I love to talk about granny Cutts, but the fact is, they were talking. It wasn't like they were sitting there stoic. We got this idea that they go to the Lord's Supper and they sit there and suddenly there's this formal. No, they ain't. They're ratchet jawing. That's a southern term. Meaning yakety, yakety, yak. Probably interrupting each other just like y'all do at your table. And your mom says, hush now. He's still talking. Y'all you know how that goes, right? So then Jesus says, um, for he knew with him, not at all you, that he washed their feet, sat at the table, do you know what I have done to you? Now he's got their attention. Now nobody's talking. Now everybody's watching him, paying attention. What is he talking about? Then he tells them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, and you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you, and here it is, underline your Bible, an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, Neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm not greater than the Father who sent me. If you know these things, you are blessed if, circle that word, you do them. In other words, folks, knowing the word does you no good if you don't apply it. I do not speak of all, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I've chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread and lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you, and here's an important statement, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, that you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to ye, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. So he is demonstrating the servant's heart. He's lesson time. He's teaching them about servant. Why is this important? Because it wasn't one of them things where you sit around the table and drink a little wine to him and then suddenly he gets up and no, man, this is an ongoing evening process. And then we blow by it so much so that we've lost the really what's going on here. All right. And the last thing he tells them from now on, heads up. In verse 20, put yourself a note out there. Salvation simplified. Salvation simplified. In other words, receive Jesus. You receive the ones he sends, you receive the Father who sent him. How cool is that? You want to get saved? Receive Jesus. All right. We got the place prepared, the body prepared. Now we've got to get the mind prepared. Go to Matthew. Matthew 26, if you will. Matthew 26, and beginning in verse 21. What we're going to do is get the mind prepared. Remember, he just got through telling them, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, so when it happens, you'll believe it. Y'all with me? Y'all heard that part, right? Well, now listen here. He's fixing to lay it on them. And as they were eating, he said, truly, 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 I say to you that one of you will betray me. Stop the truck. Stop the truck. Here they are at dinner, right to joy, having a big time, and they washed their feet, taught, taught them this lesson about being a servant, right? 
now he's making this announcement. Why? Because he told them he was going to tell them so when it happened, they would understand. Look up here for a second. What do you think the preacher does every Sunday? Tells you what's going to happen. Why? So you believe it when it happens. Where do I get my prophecy? God's word. I ain't making this stuff up. Come out of the book. Okay? Trust me on this. Everybody's going to die. The question is where are they going to end up in eternity? That is going to happen. We're going to die. In verse 22, and being deeply grieved. Oh, man, can you imagine the emotion that went in that room at that moment? Here are these 12 men that have been walking with him for three and a half years, and he's sitting there telling them, one of y'all going to betray me. And then they're brokenhearted, they're grieved. They each want to begin to say, surely not I, Lord. It's as if none of them want to admit that we're going to do it. Now, I can tell you one thing, friends. If you study the New Testament, you'll find out that more than one occasion, more than one of them, grieve Jesus' heart by things they did and said and so forth and so on. But this is serious. He's talking about betrayal. Betrayal. And he answered and said to them in verse 23, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. There's your proclamation, folks. That going doesn't mean he's going down to the supermarket. That means he's leaving this world. And, but woe to him that, that man, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man had he not been born. Oh, what a proclamation. And folks, you've got to remember, you're sitting there at this evening meal with these people, and Jesus is saying it, and the guy that's going to do it knows he's going to do it. He's already planned it. He's already worked out the details, as it were. What do you imagine was going on in his heart? It's like a person that proclaims to be a child of God and then go out and overtly sins against God, knowing ahead of time that he was going to do it before he made a proclamation. Randy Curtis years ago had the privilege of leading this young girl to the Lord right here. Made a proclamation, love Jesus Christ. A month later, we ain't never seen her. Boogity, boogity. We baptized her based on her profession of faith. A year or so later, she showed back up. She came down the front. A signal for Randy. He come down there. Took him to the back room. And you got to understand, this is the same girl that made a proclamation the year before. And Randy asked her, says, well, what are you doing here now? I don't know her exact word, but here's what it boils down to. It wasn't real the first time. In other words, I came down before. I lied to God. I lied to the auditorium. I lied to the people. And I lied to you, Brother Randy. I wasn't really saved. I just wanted to do it. I wanted the recognition. I wanted the meism. And what's even more tragic she left again. So I don't know if she ever got saved or not. True. But here's Judas. No one he's going to do this. And Jesus pointed him out right there. And he knows he's got to be inside of him. Somehow he's got to rationalize in his heart and mind what he's fixing to do. Let me tell you something, young people and middle-aged people. Us old people, we already know it. We're, we're masters at it. The fine art of rationalization. You need to learn what that means because you kids use it all the time. You just don't know what it's called. You know what rationalization is? That's justifying your wrong behavior in your own mind. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but, and you will come up with a reason that convinces you it's all right to be stupid. But it isn't. You'll convince yourself that it's all right to sin against your family and to God Almighty, but it isn't. Judas had to have been toying in his mind. How, well, you know, Judas wanted Jesus to come up and bring down the legion of angels and just, just wash away all them Roman soldiers so the Jews could be free. And he figured, you know, if I put Jesus on the spot, that's what he's going to do. He ain't heard a word Jesus said in three years. That's not the way he does things. Well, so he's telling them the betrayer. 
And then in verse 25, Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Surely not I. Well, there's another lie, isn't there? I, Rabbi? He said to him, Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. In other words, he not only told him in verse 21 of the betrayer, in verse 22 of the disbelief, the grief by them, and then this verse 23 and 24, his declaration by Jesus of what's going to happen, and then lo and behold, in verse 25, the acknowledgement by Jesus, me? And Jesus says, yep, you, Bubba. You're going to do this. Well, we got the place prepared, and now we got the heart prepared. Flip over to Luke, Dr. Luke's proclamation, if you would. Luke into the 22nd chapter. Luke 22. Put your finger down at verse 24. I love, let me tell you something. You hear that pieces of paper rustling? I love that. Preachers love to hear them Bible pages turning. Oh, yeah. Luke, chapter 22, verse 24. We there? Yes. Man, what happened to all that excitement when we first started worship service? Y'all, wake up. We're just getting rolling good. And there arose among, and there, and there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the what in the world? Where'd, I, where'd it come up this? Wait a minute. I thought we was at the Lord's Supper meal. We are. We're sitting around the table and they get into an argument. Arguing with each other about who is going to be the greatest amongst the twelve. Let that sink in. They're here because they have to celebrate the Passover. They don't know what Jesus is fixing to do. They're doing the ritual Passover celebration. Remember what God did coming out of Egypt meal. And Jesus teaches them about being servanthood. And then he unfolds how Judas, and by the way, don't think that there was, a, like when Jesus got up to leave and all that, that, people didn't realize what he was doing. And just because Jesus said something that's written here doesn't mean he made it loud enough for everybody around the room to hear it. I mean, he leaned over in his conversation with Judas but Judas, Jesus has already told him the guy that dips after me. Well, guess what? People are dipping their morsels into stuff, and, and Judas is one of them. And Jesus said to him, verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. But let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the servant. Did you get that? In other words, in God's way of thinking, if you think you're somebody, you want to be somebody, none people, look up here. You want to be somebody, be nobody. You want to be somebody, be a nobody. Let God exalt you. Let your good works exalt you. Let your Christian heart exalt you. Let your good grades exalt you. Let your good spirit exalt you but not you exalting you. Move your finger back up to verse 15. Give me an amen. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So here we go. He done got them the, 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 the foot washing, the servanthood. He done told them what's going to happen. He's got to leave. He said, somebody's going to betray me. And then they start arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> and then he's making this other announcement. This is the last time I'm having Passover with you. There was a lot going on that day, wasn't there? I mean, you know, these poor disciples had to scope all this up and try to, Gene, can you imagine in their mind trying to get it straight? Really? You know, one of the most amazing things to me when I'm teaching people about this stuff is we sit here so plain vanilla as if it was simply, simply. Look, folks, you're reading the Bible with the clear eyes of hindsight. 
try to read it from a perspective at that, that disciple that's getting this firsthand, and he's do what? Lord, I mean, listen to Peter. Lord, what are you talking about? You ain't going to wash me. This is all coming about in their world, and it's, and it's like a, a jumble of things. So not only do they have to overcome him, they have to accept the challenging news. Next thing they got to do is they have to grasp the new covenant. Stay in chapter 22, put your finger down to verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after it was had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. They got to grasp this new covenant. We're going to get in detail on that in just a few minutes. But he's, he's trying to get them to see that there's a change going on. That the, the way of doing things is not the same as it was. Folks, you got to remember that up until now, these people have been living under the law that Moses had written down that God gave him, the standards of God. Now, they had fallen quite short, just like you and I did. And Jesus comes along and he's trying to get them to see the law hadn't changed. It's just now you've got the Holy Spirit that's going to be with you to reach God's standards. God's will is still out there, folks. He still says no to murder and rape and adultery and, and, and all them nasties. But now you can overcome the wickedness that's within you with the Holy Spirit. Well, we, you don't need to flip back there, but in Mark 14, verse 26, it says, after they did this, they went out singing, made their way out of Jerusalem. When your pastor was there in Jerusalem 19 years ago, I went out the gate, they went out, went down the valley and up the side to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's quite a little jaunt, by the way. And it was also at night. And here's the part I want you to, I want it to be real to you, friends. I, I, I'm trying desperately to make it as real as I can to you. I, what I want you to ponder is how is it that Jesus Christ, who, who walked with these men three and a half years, sat down this meal with them, explained to this thing about the body and the blood and so forth and so on is going to happen, right? <clears throat> and they're walking out singing. Huh? Y'all don't see anything strange there? I mean, they're walking out of that meal knowing that Jesus Christ is going to be dead and gone and not be with them anymore. And here they are singing. Get your arms around that. How can that be? Well, let's try to figure it out. It's not really that complicated. They didn't believe it. <laughs> it's simple as that. They heard it. They didn't believe it. They didn't understand what was really fixing to happen. They could have no mental, psychological concept of him going to the cross. Ain't no way that registered in their minds. Yeah, I'm going. I'm not going to be eating this meal with y'all anymore. Well, look, folks, if you don't need it with them anymore, but that means at least a year, right? So they got a year to worry about. And for most of us, a year seemed like forever. Unless you've been through the last 12 months that we've been through in this pandemic. Man. All right. Remember the bread and the blood, the new covenant. All right. First of all, he says, this bread is my body. Okay? Now, I need you, for your sake, to understand the reality that's going on here and the misbound numbers that goes on there and the disassociation with the truth that's happened in the last 2,000 years with this. The body, the bread, represented the body of Christ. Okay? Some thought they were actually eating the flesh. Okay? 
But the Aramaic language has no word for is. And Jesus is not identifying the bread with his body. Rather, hold on, his body in death. It represents his body in death as it represented the saving sacrifice for many. It wasn't just as this is my body. Remember what he said? He broke it. He was trying to get them to see that his body was going to be broken. He was going to be put to death. I'm going to die just like I'm breaking his bread in two. I'm going to be broken. I'm going to give up the spirit, as it were. You think I'm joking about eating the flesh. Part of the struggles of the New Testament Christians in the new church was that a lot of folks accused them of drinking real blood and eating real body pieces because of this Lord's Supper. Folks, we don't do real blood and we don't do real body parts. Amen? Amen. It's all symbolic for a reason. Some of the early church represented the bread and the body with the actual, uh, and there's one denomination that, that still does this, that, that when you're taking the bread and the blood and the wine, uh, that you're actually, that Jesus Christ's body, his physical body and his real blood is actually in the cup and in the, in the wafers. And I'm going to give you this word, and you write it down, and there'll be a test later who see who spelled it right. It's called transubstantiation. Did you get that, Francis? You got that transubstantiation? Okay. T R A N. S-U-B-S-T-A-N-T-I-A-T-I-O-N, transubstantiation. That's a big fancy word that means when you're doing this Lord's Supper, that somehow the blood from Jesus from heaven is coming on down and is in that cup, and the body parts of Jesus somehow has in that body part, and don't dare spill that juice on the floor because that's the blood of Jesus. Come on, folks. It's not what it's all about. It's about remembering. It's about being reminded of what Jesus did for us. Then he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out. What is the new covenant? The sovereign administration of grace instituted by God. God's grace through Jesus Christ for the redemption of all of humanity. Replacing and fulfilling the old covenant which basically was expressed through the Mosaic Law. The expression of the New Covenant found principally in the New Testament. Okay, by the way, you could change the word New Testament to New Covenant. That word Testament actually means covenant more than anything else. The blood, what is the blood poured out? What is this all about? Is there any sinners in the room? Yes. Anybody that doesn't raise your hands, lie to yourself and God? Just want to let you know, right? Because all of you are sinners, amen? The chief among you is up here because I should know better. It's just the way it is. The difference between me and most folks is I'm not shy about the Lord forgive me because I messed up one more time. Okay? Just the way it is. The new covenant says I can come to Jesus Christ. I don't have to die. I can lay my heart and soul out there saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I have messed up. Please forgive me. And his grace and mercy says, forgive me. His grace says that when you come before God Almighty and Satan's there accusing you, he's going to say, get behind me, Satan, because that boy right there is mine. I own him. His blood was shed for that old boy. That's what the new covenant's all about, friends. The blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Remember what Passover celebrates, okay? Remember what Passover celebrates. The Passover commemorates the re Israel's release from the Egyptian slavery by virtue of a what? Slain lamb, right? You get that? The slain lamb is representative of Christ to come and the Lord's Supper commemorates that. The Lord's, the Lord's Supper commemorates that redemption of God's new people, the church, the slain lamb, the Christ that did come and will come again. The reminder is this, my friends. 
That's what this is all about, to remember. One, the saving power of God. Anybody in here heard of Satan? Come on, play me. Show me in the game here tonight. That's what I love. Well, he's live and well. But let me tell you, and he's very powerful. Don't think any of you can take Satan on and win. You can't. And only by the power of Jesus Christ in you are you protected from him at all. But here's what you need to understand. Satan cannot and will not save you. He's looking forward to joining you in the lake of fire. The lake of fire created by God who created heaven for Satan and his demonic folks. And if you want to go there, you get the right to choose that. Simple as that. God's not going to send you. Why? Because of saving grace. But if you want to go, he'll let you go. Break your heart, but he will let you go. The saving power of God. And then the price, the reminder is of the price bought, brought by, bought by Jesus. He bought it with his death. And let me tell you something, folks, as we'll cover in detail next week, he didn't just die. He was tortured to death. And I dare say the toughest among you couldn't have stood what he stood. Period. I don't care how tough you think you are. There's also a reminder that the body and the blood of Christ on Calvary. Folks, it's not whether it's bread or crackers or wine or grape juice, but what it represents in the heart and mind of the believer. All right, we're getting close to our Lord's Supper. But I would not be doing my job if I didn't explain to you this one more piece to the puzzle. Let me ask you this. Does everybody understand how that evening went now? How it unfolded? You got the new pieces in there and all the things that happened? And all that was done so that we would do the Lord's Supper and remember. Okay? That's what it's all about. So, remember to be worthy partakers. We need to go to 1 Corinthians. You didn't put your Bibles up, did you? 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 23. For I have received... Are you there? 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Now, at this church, historically, we have brought this up each time we do the Lord's Supper, but we don't always go right to the Scripture and let you see it. I want you to see it today. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Can I get amen? amen. That's what it's all about. Therefore, do you get it? Let me tell you something, people. And you're doing Bible work, you see the word therefore, find out what the there is for. Therefore, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the, of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Whew, that's heavy. That's heavy, man. So the question is, how are we going to be worthy enough to take the Lord's Supper? Back to ask. This soul searching introspection, this silent confession to Christ, so that no one will sin against the spiritual presence of the Lord by irreverent, unworthy observance. In other words, if you take this Lord's Supper, we're going to do it in a minute, and you do it unworthy, you are doing it in the defiance and sinning against the spiritual presence of Jesus Christ. So, to be worthy, look at verse 28. Self-examination. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread of the cup and drink the cup. Examine myself. What am I trying to do? When I self-examination, I'm supposed to be praying for forgiveness. 
I'm supposed to be looking at myself in the mirror and say, you know, I messed up. I didn't do right. And it may be a little sin or a big sin, but it's still just sins to God. If you haven't confessed and laid it out before him, whatever it may be, my friends, then you're sitting there unworthily. Get right with God. Secondly, unfolding newness of heart and life. A newness of heart and life. And, and, and I don't need you to go chase down these verses. I've got them for you, but there they are. You can write them down. Clean out the old leaven so that it may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Get rid of the leaven in your life. What's leaven? That part that ain't supposed to be there. Remember the Passover meal? Unleavened bread. The part that swells the bread up. Took it out. It represents, leaven in this sense represents that sin in your life. Unfold a newness of heart and life. Three, be wholly separate to God. Be wholly separate to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 21 tells you, do not drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. In other words, friends, you choose where you want to walk. You can't be in the world and in Christ at the same time. Well, I know that's tough. Unworthy partakers. Hmm. People who do it anyway. Look at verse 29, where we were. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and in number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. What we're saying is if we're guilty of the blood and the body of Christ. To sin against another believer is to sin against Christ. Those guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord are also those who despise a poor member by utter disregard of their need. In other words, you know somebody within the flock that needs something and you don't take care of it, just sin it against them because they're your brother in Christ. And you bring that to the table. Not being discerning about the Lord's body, the church. Not being discerning about the Lord's body, the church. The body of Christ is the church. Folks, it, it, this church is not some big building. It is a big building. It's a mighty beautiful building. But it's just the building. You are the body. You make up the body of Christ. You make up the church. And as believers, you are in the body of Christ. And it consists of these individual believers coming to the Lord's Supper without, a, without that sin confessed will bring judgment on the guilty participants. Does anybody know the blasting radius of a grenade? I do. Intimately. Three to five feet. So, so a pineapple-sized grenade, everything three to five feet around it is going to get shrapnel. That's, that's a big area, right? You know what I'm saying? So when you come to the Lord's Supper with unconfessed sin, you are like that grenade. You are affecting the well-being of everybody around you. Because you bring this leaven into the body. You bring this attitude into the body. You bring this mindset into the body. You bring a, a negativism into the body instead of the great joy of loving the Lord. Only by recognizing the unity of the body of the Lord and acting accordingly can we avoid bringing judgment on themselves. We are visited with judgments. Verse 30, for this reason many among you are sick and weak and a number sleep. As explained by Paul, in brief, it was sickness and death. The solution was this self-examination, self-discipline, and promoting of the unity of the body of Christ. 
So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. I hope that I have made myself as clear as I know how about what you need to do during this prayer time. You need to get right with Jesus. Matter of fact, some of you may need to get on your knees down here because you know from what's been going on in your life, you've not been all you need to be in the Lord. I can't remember what brought it to mind, but somewhere here recently, we were talking about some children, and they were exposed to some behavior that's inconsistent with godly Christian behavior. And they were troubled by it. They didn't know what to do. So they did the right thing. They went and told their mom and dad. Folks, do you realize everything that you do that a young person sees, especially a child, if it's not godly, they picking up on it? You think they're not, you think they're ignoring it? They're not. They're watching you. Now, I realized when I took on this responsibility that God gave me for being a pastor, I live in a fishbowl. I know that. Every word I say, how I say it, where I go, what I do, everything I do in life is somebody's checking the motivation, the why, the when, and I understand that. And that's why I have to pray so much because I mess up. But I'm not alone here, friends. What example are you setting for children and, listen to me, all of you, what example are you setting for the rest of the body of Christ right now about what you're doing, how you're doing? Nothing inspires Christians to be on fire for Jesus more than to be around other Christians on fire for Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's infectious, man. You ain't never seen so much excitement when you see a group of Christians doing the work of the Lord, man. It's just... And no matter how painful it may be or how hot it is or how cold it is or how hungry you are, man, just be doing God's stuff is awesome. And doing God's stuff with other people doing God's stuff is more awesomer. I just made that up for you. Just add an R onto awesome and you'll be fine. We're going to pray. You know what you need to do. The Bible just told you, self-examine. Now, I'm not going to go around and knock you on the head and see make you're doing it. But God may. He may. So get honest with him. Let's pray.